Hello and welcome to the show. Today we have Dylan Shively here. He is with the James Warren Group. They focus on credit education and credit repair. Did you know that 98.8% of people have less than perfect credit? Their mission is to change that one family at a time. Dylan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, this is great. So how did you get into this? How did you get into, uh, you know, doing credit repair? Yeah, so um, my my history getting started, uh, I went off to the Army when I was 17. I was in for six years. And right after that, uh, I went right into car sales when I got home. And so in my car sales time, I was, you know, making some good money and, you know, everybody was buying cars. It felt like I worked at a Subaru dealership and I feel like it's one of those brands. It was like selling itself. And, um, you know, so selling cars. And then I did the, the stupid thing that most people my age do. And as I was making money, I'm like, look at all this money that I have to spend. Let me go get a nice three bedroom apartment, even though at that time I was single and only needed one room. You know, let me go buy a second and a third car after I bought my first one because cars are like my obsession. That's that's my hobby and my habit. And um, I thought this was just going to be forever. And I had this mentality where, hey, if I um, if I just sell this car and I know I'm getting paid this much, that's that much money I'll have in my bank account so I could go buy the next thing. And I just developed this really bad habit. Well, then I learned that there's something called a market. Um, Because again, I was young, I was like 22. So I learned that markets change and not everybody's buying cars all the time, every single day. So we had a few months stretch where people weren't buying as many cars. And that meant I wasn't getting paid because if I didn't sell cars, I didn't make money. Yet all of these bills I created for myself still existed and everybody still wanted their money the same time in the same day, every single month. They didn't care that I wasn't selling as many cars as before. They're like, well, you still owe us this money. So uh, credit card debt started to go up a little bit and uh, actually got one of my cars repossessed. Um, you know, I started to kind of go downward spiral in a way. And um you know, after that, I started realizing, damn, I can't buy anything. And so I even like took a couple of my cars and I traded them in for a less expensive car that gave me a bunch of equity. Um, and I took that check, you know, and I paid some of my stuff, but I just couldn't keep up um, just because I had so many things that were coming out. So I didn't really understand that, hey, you're supposed to save some of this stuff. And uh it's crazy because I would talk to people about credit all the time when they'd want to buy a car. And if our finance manager said they weren't approved. So it's like, I knew better. Um, but I just thought it was forever. So, uh, I wind up hiring a company and, uh, it went really bad. So I paid the company over $2,000 and they told me that they were going to do all of these things for me and that they're going to wipe all this debt. And it, it was going to be this like picture perfect thing. And I was like, okay, like if you're the expert, I trust what you say. Cause it sounds like, you know, more than me. And I put my trust in them and I did it. Well, they didn't do any of the things that they said they were going to do. Uh, my scores actually just kept going down. And uh, they told me I had to default on even the stuff I was positive on because I needed to show an example of going through a hardship. And I was like, well, I'm already kind of going through the hardship, which is why I'm here. But like, why do I got to make it harder than what it is? Can I be good on some of the stuff? Nope. You got to default on everything. That's our process. This is how it works. I'm like, all right. Well, my score dropped all the way down into like the mid 400s. Um, as somebody who is sitting like a young kid who is sitting in the upper to mid 700s, that's a big deal. So at that time, man, I couldn't finance a tank of gas. And uh, it really pissed me off because I'd call them and call them. They wouldn't get back to me. Um, but if I took my account off the auto withdrawal for them to put like this money in this escrow account for them to settle stuff, um, all of a sudden they knew how the phone worked. Hey, Mr. Shively, we were just calling because that payment that we have scheduled, it, it, it didn't deposit. Is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, actually, before I deposit it, I have some questions. So why did my score go down again? How come you told me this? And the complete opposite happened. 
when do you plan on doing this thing that you told me in the initial call you were going to do? Oh, Mr. Shadley, let me go find out for you, but let's get that card connected so I can activate your account and then I can give you that answer. Right. Then I'd go and I'd give it to them and then they'd be like, all right, let me transfer you to this department. Click. And it was just bad. So I was just like, you know what? Fuck this. And, um, yeah, it's so brutal. This like pettiness and competitiveness that I have, uh, where I was like, wait a fucking minute. If this company is as big as what it is and they got all these reviews and of course a mixture of good and bad, but like if they got all these reviews means they have all these customers. And if they're in all these States and doing all this business and this is how they treat people, I can do way fucking better than that. Yeah. And, um, so then I kind of <laughs> took it into my own hands and I was like, I'll figure it out. So I went and started fixing my credit. I started, uh, you know, going online and finding people who like, you know, teach you about credit. Um, then I actually got certified through FICO. Like I took classes and stuff like that. Not like a college course, but like a direct course with them. And uh, I started getting obsessed with trying to figure out how to fix my own because I was determined to get myself out of the situation. So I wound up fixing mine. I'm a big Facebook person. I wound up posting um, my results and kind of the journey of what happened. And then I started getting all these DMs, like when my scores started going up and they're like, Hey, I got medical debt. Hey, what happens when my credit card is maxed out? Hey, what happens in this situation? Oh, I got a broken lease. And you know, can you help me with this? And um, I was just like, wow, this is taking up uh, a lot of time. Like a lot of people are asking for help. So then I did the research thing again. Well, this is, this can be a business. Let me figure out, you know, how do I charge and what's the expectation that I set? So I wind up rolling with it. I went full-time with credit repair, um, late 2016. Like it was literally, I think like late December, um, of 2016 where I started like taking people on and, uh, fast forward to today. We have, uh, we're licensed and bonded in all 50 states. We can help clients all around the United States. Um, I have 39 employees on staff. And right now we have just over 6,300 active clients. Um, yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah, it, it grew pretty quick. The system relies on us not being educated on how yep. it works. And mm -hmm. I can speak for this. Like I'm 41 now, but when I was young, um, you know, I was, you know, 18 years old and they, I was introduced to overdraft, right? I don't know if that's a big thing down there or not, but I was introduced to overdraft back then. And I didn't know what it was. And, you know, they gave me $500 overdraft and they gave me a thousand dollars to overdraft and then $2,500 overdraft. And I dug myself such a deep hole that all I'm literally doing is paying the interest payments. Right. And I mean, I didn't even have a credit card then. And literally all I'm doing is paying like these interest payments. Yeah, like the bank is giving me an extra $2,500 to spend in my bank account oh, in the negatives. No, it's crazy. So I didn't know what I'm doing. I'm young. On top of that, so I'm digging this hole here. On top of it, I, you know, got some money. You know, I paid that off. I had to get a loan to pay that off. So now I'm paying interest on a loan to pay off the overdraft. And then I came into some money like, you know, a year or two later, and I put all this money into RRSPs. And I didn't know how RRSPs work. The bank told me, put money into RRSPs. Well, I had like $3,000 in there and I'm like, hey, well, I need some money. So I said, hey, I like, uh, I want to take the $3,000 out of RRSPs. And they come and give me a check for like 2,100 bucks. Like, what's this? Oh, well, you get taxed on the rest. Nobody explained it to me. It's the whole system is like built to not educate you. Right. And they're relying on you not being educated on how it works. So for you doing what you're doing by educating people, that's a good thing. Cause it sounds like the company that was trying to help you out for $2,000 was relying on you not being educated and taking more advantage of you. It's almost like they were getting a, like a kickback from the credit card companies for digging yourself a further hole because then by your credit rating going down from my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they can charge you higher interest rates. If you want to get a loan, if you want to get a lease, you want to get anything, they will charge you higher rates. So all these other companies stand to profit 
from your credit rating continuously going down. Am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, you are. And it's here's crazy. The crazy part. So to even add more to that. So I always thought it was backwards. Um, but I guess in relation to business, you can you can see why. But here's the actual like definition for your credit score, right? And and I, I always like talking about this part because when you hear it, you're like, this makes absolutely no sense. So your credit score, some people will call it your debt score. How much debt can you get into? But actually, it is your risk score. So that score is calculated based on what they think your risk level is. Not to obtain the loan that day, but what the probability of you defaulting on the loan you're applying for within a 24-month period. Hmm. Right? So, so that's how the score is calculated. There's five factors and you score every 30 days. And, you know, we can always go more into that later if you want. Um, but that's how they're grading you. And your score is that determining factor for your probability of defaulting within a 24 month period if they approve you on that loan. Now, it was always backwards to me that, hey, your score is lower, which means there's a higher risk of you not paying this loan back. You're probably going to default. You, you have greater chances at defaulting over somebody with a better score because it's hard for you to afford this. So we're going to jack up the interest and make it even more expensive for you than somebody with better credit. I feel like that's just such an ass backwards thing. Where, like, think about it, you know, hey, you're really struggling, you know, to consolidate your credit cards. We'll give you a debt consolidation loan. However, you're going to pay 17% because it looks like you're a high risk and may not be able to pay this back. Well, now you're increasing the risk by making it more expensive instead yeah. of more affordable. Yeah, how are you supposed to afford that? Never mind. You look at, you know, you start looking at inflation, you look at all the costs yeah. of living you're making it even harder to live and you might as well just go buy macaroni and cheese and oriental noodles or ramen noodles, I guess is what everyone likes to call it nowadays because that's all you're gonna be able to eat. Right. Like, you know, it's, you know, and that's the thing. Like when I was young, I got kind of stuck in that because I looked at it as free cash, similar to you, your story. And then I learned really quickly how to leverage it, how to pay it off, how to, how to wait until the bill comes in, then pay it off. So then I'm like using it for cash flow, right? You know, and even like right now with our family, we we go to Costco and we do shopping, we do everything on the credit card, and then and then we actually get um, we actually get the bill, and then I pay it like two weeks later, which is like a little bit later. So now we're turning 45 days of cash flow in because we pay for everything with the Mastercard. When in the past, for many years, we paid everything debit right away. Mm -hmm. So we also get rewards by paying with the credit card. We're increasing our credit score. I'm, I'm assuming you probably confirm that all because of how we're. But the thing is, what happens is these credit card companies, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this. They have this thing now when you log in, get a payment plan for your purchases. Mm -hmm. So now they're trying to get you to paid over the next six weeks for the next three months for like a $400 purchase for like groceries. And they're hoping you're none the wiser, mm -hmm. right? And that you end up getting stuck in this rut of paying interest because to them, it's a business, right? Right. And your job is to try and educate people on how to manage, manage that I'm assuming, or yeah, just to so fix their credit repair that so and like, both. Yeah. So we do it all. And, and I think that's one of our biggest differentiators. Most companies only focus on, hey, we're going to you know, try to dispute negative items for you, um, but they don't go above and beyond after that, right? They just, they just leave it at that. Um, where, you know, for my company, we really focus on the education piece. So one, we're going to teach you how credit works, you know, what the actual mechanical factors are that influence your score to go up or down, how to understand it very simple. So then that way, you know, to start doing this and stop doing that. Um, in addition, we help you rebuild and restructure the credit report. So then that way, you're not just adding accounts like, you know, people see that like the, 
hey, let me finance this payment, you know, for groceries um, to tell them to avoid those things and why they're not good. So we walk them through the entire process and we work for the clients till we get them over a 700. Uh, it doesn't matter what their, their starting point is because I feel like it's not acceptable to let a client graduate from our program any less than a 700 because we didn't really do them uh, the due diligence. We didn't, we didn't do the job to its full potential till they get there. Um, yeah, man, the, the credit card companies, like the good news is that we know the game that they want to play. And sometimes you got to get it, give a little trade off here or there, right? You got to give them a little bit of what they want. So in turn, you get what you want, right? And there's a fine line between it. So <clears throat> I can say this, use your credit cards for everything, because just like you were saying, cash back rewards, mileage points, rack all that stuff up. You don't get any incentives when you use your debit card. And that money is immediately taken out of the bank account. Whereas you have 30 days or so to go pay back a portion of the money that you spent on the credit card. Now, uh, credit card utilization is the number two influence to the score going up or down. So the lowest your score can be is a 300. The highest it could be is an 850, which means there's 550 points the scores can change. So of that 550 number, utilization contributes 165 points towards that 550. So your credit card balances have a huge play into what your scores say. And, um, you know, it's just using the right cards to stack the right rewards and then cash out some of that cash back. So you're actually saving some money or accumulating some of the actual free money. There are cards that give great incentives, but they're only great if you use them. I like talking about your credit score being like a muscle. So there's a lot of people who sign up for the gym, but paying the membership doesn't get you in shape, right? It's actually showing up and doing the work and going to failure and changing the diet and doing all those things, right? What do paying you mean? Paying, paying for the membership doesn't get you in shape. You have to actually show up and do work. Yeah. Like you <laughs> might actually have to pick up one of those weight things in there. You know, you and, might have and to do something. Times. You know, nice. so and, and your credit score is the same. There's a lot of people who may be pretty cash heavy and they're like, you know, I don't need credit. And it's not a matter of needing it. You're actually the person that these banks want to lend money to. We have to structure your credit report to look like you don't need the money. And then that's how you get the money so cheap. Because think mm -hmm. about it. If you need the money, they're going to charge you a lot of interest because you need it really bad. Now, all of a sudden, it's supply and demand mentality mm. where if you look like you don't need it, they're like, come on, just take a little bit. And you're like, no, I'm not taking your money. Fuck you. I got my own money. Right. And then they're like, but what if we do it for like zero percent for 12 months? All right. Well, maybe now I'll consider using your money because I'm going to pay it off within 12 months. Right. So there's nothing wrong with using your credit. Actually, as a matter of fact, I say use it often, just use it with discipline, right? Don't, don't go max your things out and make minimum payments. You're never going to get out of that snowball, right? There's, there's a lot of things. I can, I can go down a rabbit hole of like 50 million things with credit. But Well, let's, let's switch gears a little bit then. Let's, uh, let's get into a few things here. So um, what was your most memorable experience as a customer? So actually, I just had one recently. That And that's not why I remember it. I think I'm going to forever remember it because it was the smallest gesture that changed my entire mood that morning. So there is a local restaurant that's here. It's kind of like a, a breakfast and lunch place. They're not really open like late. They always do breakfast and lunch. <clears throat> and uh, I went there the first time and the food was really good. And I was like, man, this is the spot that I'm going back to. And I'm going to bring people back here because I want other people to try it right? Because that's what good experience, you know, feels like. So I had a meeting with somebody <clears throat> and I was like, Hey man, we're, we're going to this breakfast spot. I, I had it. I uh, just had it the other day. It was so fucking good. We got to go back. And he's like, all right. So I'm a very on time person. So I showed up on time. He was about 15, 20 minutes late. And, but like, I already grabbed the table and I'm sitting there. Well, the waitress comes out and she's like, 
hey, how's it going? Like, are, are, are you waiting for somebody? And I'm like, yeah, he just running behind, whatever. He said he'd be here like 15 minutes ago. He's still not here. And, you know, it's fine. And she's like, well, I'd imagine you're probably hungry. And she's like, I don't know if you want to order without him or whatever. And I was like, no, I, I, I want to wait. I don't want to be that guy. Like you show up and I'm already eating. Like, um, you know, I'll wait for him. So she's like, you know, that's really nice. And she's like, hey, you said you were uh, new here, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's my second time coming. I was just here a couple of days ago. I got this Spuds Deluxe thing. It was really good. And she's like, well, we're really known for our pancakes. You ever had one of our pancakes before? You know, maybe that's something you should try to order. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I will order some pancakes. And, um, you know, but I'll, I'll wait for him to get here. And she's like, well, what's your favorite? And uh, I was like, man, I'm basic. I, I like chocolate chip pancakes. And she's like, oh, that's cool. All right. And, um, you know, she walked by a couple more times and, you know, he wasn't there yet. And then he texts me. He's like, dude, I promise I'm like five minutes away. And I'm like, all right. I literally look up from the text and she came and she's like, hey, I'm paying for this. You're not. I just wanted you to try this, whether you plan on ordering or not. Here's one of our pancakes. So while you're waiting for your friend, at least you didn't order without him. And I want you to try it because I told you they were really good. And I was like, really? Like, you can add it to the bill. I can't imagine a pancake being like too much. She's like, nope. She's like, I want you to try it. And I was like, okay. So I tried it. It was absolutely fucking amazing. Um, it was just, I don't know. It was just, it was really, it was this like thick, fluffy pancake. And it was just, it was really good. And, um, you know, then he showed up and, you know, she was kind of busting on him a little bit. And, uh, you know, we ordered our food, the food came out right away and, you know, it was great. Just like the last time I remember, but the biggest takeaway from that was they were so busy, but she didn't show any of the stress of like, you know, you see some people when they're like, maybe they're short staff or something and they're going crazy, whatever. <laughs> she was the happiest person ever and it all started with the gesture of like hey you know what who you're waiting for was late that's not fair to you i want to give you one of our pancakes and i was like yeah. like i just i never forgot that and um <clears throat> you know then we finish our food and um you know we get the bill whatever and you know i pay for it and uh, you know i just i had a double check and i saw it and i was like all right you know not on there like that was super cool and uh, so I left her a very generous tip because like it made my experience really great, you know, just because I was like, man, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that, but like, that's awesome. And uh, you know, how she just managed herself. Cause I go out to eat pretty often. So um, how she just managed the whole floor and still like attention to detail with us topping off our drinks, like making sure no matter how busy she was, she was happy. She was chirpy and it felt genuine. It wasn't like the fake smile, like the customer service happiness, like, you could just tell she she must have woke up on the right side of the bed or something. She was super happy and it just it made everything better. You know, Dude, you like know. when it comes to pancakes, I swear there's like 50 different ways I've tried making them, but there's only one way that I find myself and the kids really like them. And I keep that recipe now, right? Because you know, once you find like a good, good pancake it's it's hard to like not want to go back to that same place yep. over and over again especially like i don't know pancakes like you know it's kind of a weakness so I mean, let me tell you this. <laughs> um just to kind of wrap up that thought too so ever since that time has happened i have been back in the in the last month and a half almost two months i've been back more than 12 times and have brought people back just like for them to have that experience and for them to try the food. And like, so now I've like, that has been my go-to place, you know, and um, whether she's working or not, you know, I'll ask for her by preference, but um, even when not, like I just bring everybody to that place. So, you know, on the business side of things, you know, I'd imagine because a lot of their employees looked like chirpy and happy and they were on the go and moving. Um, they're doing something right there because the people are happy and like they deliver that through the customers. And I spent way more money there. Cause it's not a cheap place to eat. Like breakfast is usually known to be pretty cheap. Um, not at this place. You're definitely paying for experience, but like I have paid for it many, 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 many times, man. It's, you, you know, I got this story. It was, you know, we're talking Easter weekend 
we wanted to go down to the States and we wanted to go to Seattle and Portland and we wanted to do a whole bunch of stuff for Easter long weekend. And we went to our bank and our bank is known for being open seven days a week and it's closed on the Saturday. It's not supposed to be closed on the Saturday of the Easter long weekend, but it was closed. And we started realizing like their whole schedule changed. They weren't open longer hours like they used to their customer service had dropped i think they used the whole covid to you know you know whatever use as an excuse to lower their customer service customer experience and everything so i go to this other bank because i actually didn't even know it was a bank i mean i just seen it said financial i was like i don't know let's just pull up to this place went up there and i said hey listen i'm going to the states and i just want to have u.s funds with me just in case something happens like you know your credit card to get flagged or something right and they go, you know what? We don't normally do this, but you know what? We can, we can help you out. And I had Canadian cash with me. So they took it and they gave me USD back. And they were really, they had conversations with me. They took care of me. They helped me out. And then I, and then I told them after about 15 minutes of chatting back and forth, I'm like, you know, I own, I have a podcast called Focus on Customer Experience, and this is what it's all about. So then. I went back there and then three months later, I go to my bank again on a Saturday. It's supposed to be open. It says we're closed due to staff shortages. I'm like, what? And I, and I have like $2,500 in cash that I need to go and deposit. And I'm not going to put it in the ATM in the drive through just because, well, anyways, I, that's a whole different story of why I won't do that. So I go over to there and I see that same lady at the counter. And the other guy at the counter who I also talked to, and they're both very nice to me. And I go, do you remember me? She goes, yeah, I remember you. You came in Easter long weekend. So she remembered me. It's like three, four months later. And I go, I'm here to open up an account. Why? Because it's all about the long game. It's all about taking care of the clients. And so many people are focused on the transaction. They're so focused on just what's in it for me right now. And you know, the place you went to, it sounds like they were looking at it going, you know, we give him a free pancake. Hey, if he loves it, cool. If he doesn't, well, then he doesn't like it. Either way, it didn't cost him anything, right? But then you ended up liking it. And then it also now it's blossomed into something else where you just keep coming back and you're recommending everybody. Why? Because they're looking at the long term, right? They're looking at building a relationship with you. So I think that's, that's awesome. So what is, what is one thing you do or have done to provide a, a positive experience for your clients? Yeah. So I think it boils down to setting the proper expectations because in my industry, it is very known to be kind of more of like a shadier industry. Um, kind of based on like my experience, you heard like how I got started. That is a very common experience that a lot of people have. Um, so there's, you know, somebody that will say, hey, I help people fix credit. Everybody inquires. And then they charge all this money. And if what they do works to a certain point, they're like, okay, great. But then after that, what winds up happening is the customer service is shit. They don't really know what they're talking about. They're not certified by anybody. They're not licensed or bonded by anybody. Like they're not validated, right? Because it's a, a low barrier to entry to start something like this. So they're kind of like what you said. They're looking at the transactional piece rather than being relationship-based. So the simple term that I could put on it, what makes us different and how you deliver a high customer experience is just not being a piece of shit. Meaning like <laughs> we tell the client, hey, Here's all the possibilities. Here's how this works. Here's how it does not work. Because there's a lot, of <clears throat> a lot of information out there that tells people your credit will be fixed overnight. It will be really fast. We're going to delete all these negative items. It's 100% guaranteed. All of that is not true. Right? We, we submit letters on your behalf and we're waiting for the bureaus to respond. But the credit bureaus make the decisions, not us. You're paying us for a service. You're not paying us for an outcome. But we can tell you that we've helped thousands of people over time get a desired outcome. 
So, so we know the strategy and what to do, but nothing is perfect, right? So we set the proper expectation and let them know this is how often we communicate. This is what you can expect results wise. Here's what's happened in the past, but just keep in mind, it is variable for every single person. It's different, um, but we're going to do all that we can. And our original promise is that we're going to work with you till we get you into the 700s. Um, so I think setting that expectation from the beginning um, is, you know, where we start with differentiating in the customer experience side, you know, just giving them the, the peace of mind to know we've done this before. You can check us out. You can see what people have to say about us. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we're going to do what we say that, uh, you know, that we do, we're not going to mislead you or just try to gain the sale. I've actually talked some people out of working with us because they actually didn't need us, um, <clears throat> rather than trying to collect the money for the fee. Right. So <clears throat> there are some people that just have high credit card debt and they didn't have collections or charge offs. So mm -hmm. I'm just, like, hey, you don't necessarily need credit repair. You know, but we need to get you a debt consolidation loan. We need to get these credit card balances down and watch your scores go up. <clears throat> and most people would be like, Dylan, that's dumb. Like you could have charged there to give her that advice. And I'm like, why would I do that? And I can tell you this, every time that happens, usually there's over the next few months, there's anywhere from two to four referrals from that person because I didn't charge them and did the right thing and they saw the outcome. And then they refer other people over and some of those people actually did need help. So I wind up indirectly um, gaining more business just by doing the right thing the first time. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Because I mean, you know, the big thing everybody gets hooked on, uh, gets hooked on, especially like entrepreneurs, is you want an outcome. And what happens is someone's selling you a bad bill of goods, right? And that's what happens to a lot of these people, you know, and I got roped into it multiple times just as an entrepreneur where, you know, uh, we'll do this marketing, you'll be so busy, your business will be this, this and that, right? You get roped into it because you're getting sold a bad bill of goods. You give them their money and then no positive outcome comes. And I mean, I've had... We could probably say at least twenty thousand dollars worth of money spent, if not more, on people who told me they're consultants, they're this, they're that, they're going to get me this outcome, and they never come through, right? And honestly, like you know, even a lot of these people have fake reviews and all sorts of stuff like that. So you got to really be cautious on who you are. And honestly, I always find the people who self teach themselves, which is what you had to do. And that's what I had to do with tons of stuff. I mean, I hired professionals to do stuff within my business. And then because they screwed me, I had to self-teach myself search engine optimization, self-teach myself marketing, self-teach how to build a website. I mean, all these things I had to do. And then because of that, now I can give people great advice, you know, and that's what happened to you. You got screwed by someone who was supposed to take care of you. You went and self-taught yourself. Now you have a proven track record. And now you've been giving all these people, now you have 37 employees. That's huge, huge accomplishment. Thank you. Right? Uh, I, I think the same way you do. Um, I have a really strong um, reason behind this, that this way of thinking, but I truly believe that you can't give what you don't possess, right? And you've probably heard some, some form of this before. But if you want to get in shape, you're not going to go ask the 400 pound friend how to fucking lose weight. You're just not. Why not? You know, because there's a different <laughs> knowledge versus action, right? Yes. I'm going to be around the people who knowing it doesn't mean shit. Doing something about what the knowledge you have means something, right? So um, there's, a, there's been a lot of times I've had that happen too, where uh, I paid somebody 10 grand. And um, he was supposed to, you know, put me on to, you know, all this information, how it's going to blow my business up. I was like, dude, you don't know nothing about my business. You're not even in the same field. And he swore to me, swore to me, like, and he had a very successful business. Let me, let me just say, um, <clears throat> like provable shown. I knew 100% for a fact, um, like he, he had a really nice Amazon business that um, the two years ago when I did it, uh, he did just over 40 million. Um, so like he was, he was doing well, um, you know, but he thought that he can generalize some of that information and, and help other people with their businesses. And I was like, dude, I just need more employees. 
And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, I bet you I can pick apart something. I can poke a hole somewhere and find where you're dropping the ball. I'm like, okay, go do it. And um, so, you know, we set it up and, uh, you know, are you doing this? Are you doing this? And I'm like, yep. And he's like, well, do you have a system for this? And I was like, yep, this is how it works. Here's my system. Okay, well, what about this? What about this? Yep, now I'm there too. Man, it really looks like you just, you need to hire more help. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And, um, you know, then he, he introduced me to a way of trying to like put myself out there to hire people. And uh, he got me connected in that way. And then as soon as it happened, like, which by the way, I didn't hire any people through his, his thing. But as soon as like that got set up, I never heard from him since. Never got back to me, nothing. Yeah, that's man, that's me. that's terrible. Yeah. But so it also I really... feel like overall, customer experience, if you want to make it really good, just do the right thing for the person across from you. You know, no matter, no matter what industry you're in, just do the right fucking thing. <clears throat> and if you have to ask yourself what the right thing is, you could go to like the most cliche thing in the world of like treat others how you want to be treated. Just yeah. throw yourself in that client's shoes. Understand if they're coming at you frustrated about something and you didn't directly do it, they're not mad at you. So don't catch an attitude and like, don't talk to me that way and blah, blah, blah. Like now they're frustrated about something. Solve the fucking problem. Because if you solve the problem, then guess what? You're going to be their best friend. And most times the people that are most angry about something is because nobody solved their problem and nobody listened to them. So if you become the person who solves their problem, two things can happen. One, you learn that you might have a legitimate flaw in your business. That client may be frustrated about something that is legitimate that you never took into consideration to think, damn, maybe I could do it better this way. Or I thought it was good, but from that perspective, clearly it's not. That's something I need to fix. And then you can thank that person, right? And solve their problem and then thank them. Man, I never really looked at it that way. I'm glad you brought it to me and I'm sorry I got to where it went, but I'm glad that you brought it up and that it got to me so I can solve something like this. I can tell you most of our systems and most of the ways we communicate with people and most of the things we do, those don't come from me. Those come from my employees that are doing the work every single day, like they're in those trenches every day. And they get it from feedback from clients. You know, man, I really wish you guys, you know, would show me this. I wish you had a portal. You know, I wish you had this. I wish you had that. You know, I wish you would have told me this at this time instead of this time. We document all that. Yeah. And I actually implement that stuff, you know, and then we'll do a rollout and be like, hey, customers, we actually listen to you. Like, we got lots of feedback about you would love this layout to look like this instead of this. You wish you got this push notification instead of an email when it came to this. Anything that they say, if it makes sense and they're telling me how they want to be communicated with or how they want to receive the information, if I can make it work and it makes them happy, I do it. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's what you have to do, right? You have to separate yourself. You have to take care of people. And I mean, a lot of that's missing nowadays, right? And I ask everybody for... Well, I don't ask everybody, sir. I sent an email to everybody asking for feedback. Mm -hmm. And and I've had people say to me, well, what if you get a bad Google review? I said, well, you know, what if a customer is unhappy and you don't know about it and you can't learn how to fix it? You know, and I said, you know, getting a, a bad Google review is, is not the concern. The concern is what are you doing wrong in your systems and processes that you could be doing better, right? And I always look at it as, Everything is, I always say customers are telling us something every single time. And, you know, if they're calling and asking questions all the time, and you're always answering the same question every single time, well, why don't you have that like an FAQ on your website? Why don't you have a video made up explaining that so that you're not answering it the exact same way every single time? You're making that information more easily uh, available to the client, right? And that's the way I always look at it. And early on with the business, I got lots of those questions over and over again. I had a, uh, I had one really bad Google review, but then I looked at it, but they didn't write anything. But I was looking at the whole experience and everything that happened with it. And I looked at it as going like, sure, it was a three, which whatever. 
but I looked at what could I have done differently with everything. And I dissected that whole experience. And, you know, most people just look at going, well, you know, you know, that person was angry or, oh, that person just wasn't happy or that person didn't respect what we do. Well, you know what? Sometimes it is something you did and you have to look at what can I do differently? And you have to learn from all your experiences. And you're not going to make everybody happy, but if you can continuously learn and continuously grow and, and a big, one of my values is continuous improvement. So it's all about finding ways to improve the way we do things as a business. And it's, it sounds great what you are doing. So do you, if there's, well, do you have time for one more question? Oh yeah, absolutely. Actually, I wanted to tell you one quick thing. Sure. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> speaking of Google reviews, this still hurts my heart. <laughs> like, like legitimately, I just got my first bad Google review a couple of days ago. We've been open for close to six years and I've really prided myself and, and you know, the client count, <clears throat> like we have a decent amount of reviews. We don't have thousands, but we have like close to hundred and we were always a perfect five star. Um, and I know nobody's perfect, but I just got my first bad one. <clears throat> and, and I want to talk about that for a second. Cause it, it, it fucked me up when it happened. So, <clears throat> um, I dissected the entire reasoning that this happened. So as soon as I saw the battery, I mean, it said things like we were, we were deceiving and, and, and all types of bad things. So I'm like, man, how do we piss somebody off that bad? Like, how do we fuck up that bad? And, um, <clears throat> come to find out it wasn't even our fault. Like legitimately was not our fault because <clears throat> I got involved and I spoke with the client. So how we get majority of our clients that sign up with us, we work with real estate agents and loan officers, right? So when they have people that want to buy a home and they don't qualify due to credit, we'll go ahead and we'll help them with their credit. And four to seven months later, we'll turn them back over and you know, they're good to go. They buy a home. So this client, um, I spoke to personally and he wound up being really upset because he's been trying to communicate with his loan officer, which has nothing to do with us, um, with his loan officer for the past couple of weeks. And she's been blowing him off. So he was really pissed off about that because he couldn't get a hold of her. And uh, we were asking him to swap over, like, you know, you have to like pay for credit monitoring to like get full access to your reports. There was a current one that we used to use for a while. And um, that one, like it gave, it gave good information. It gave us the three bureau report, whatever. But <clears throat> what wind up thing was um, the client, <clears throat> uh, we were telling him we got a new credit monitoring system and it would actually be less expensive than what he's currently paying and it would give more features. But he was an older gentleman. <clears throat> so he tells me, he's like, look, I'm not tech savvy. I don't do screens. I like to be outdoors. I don't, I don't like the whole digital world. <clears throat> so I was like, all right, no problem. And, um, you know, let me just say this. If you're not tech savvy and this becomes difficult for you to make the switch that saves you money, <clears throat> I can help walk you through it. Well, he was just angry. He didn't want to, you know, do anything. And, um, he was just like, no, <clears throat> no, man, this is too much, <clears throat> you know, too much work. And I was like, all right, you know, no problem. Um, so he wanted to cancel his account. So I was like, Hey, you do understand. Like if you cancel, like, we're not going to be able to help you. That means you can't buy the home or anything like that. And he's like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just figure it out myself, you know, cause he was angry. And I was like, you can absolutely fix your own credit. That, that's no problem, man. I'm not, you know, putting it against you. Um, but it all stemmed from this bad review. It happened, I think, like four or five days ago. And um, we got the bad review ultimately because when I got on the phone with him, the first thing he complained about is how he's been trying to call the loan officer for weeks and have not heard from them. So I wind up calling our partner, the loan officer that referred him. And she said, like, yeah, we've been very busy. I've been meaning to call him back. And I'm like, well, you cost me a bad review, my first one ever. And it wasn't even really our fault. The thing he found to complain about was how difficult the switch would be to like cancel one credit monitoring and open another. Um, but he told me on the phone for that first like five minutes of the call, it was all about not being able to hear back from that loan officer. So like that one screwed me up big time because 
you know, I look at it and I'm like, man, like if somebody reads it, at least to me, like if somebody reads it, I'm like, man, the first three words is very deceiving company. And I'm like, we didn't deceive anybody, you know, but he was just ultimately frustrated. And then I don't know if you know, you can look at like reviews that people leave. Um, like other reviews besides your yeah, own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I looked at it in that same day, like a couple hours before, he left a really bad review at a restaurant. I guess he got his like wrong plate for lunch. So he made like this really bad review. And I'm like, damn, this dude was just having a bad day. Already let, you know, he had a bad lunch and wrote this really bad review for that company and then tried calling his own officer. They didn't answer him again. So then he decided to hit our Google reviews and you know we were the blood of the hit. So any business owners that are watching, be careful of your partnerships with people. Yeah, you got to be careful of your partnerships. But at the uh, at the other side of it too, is you can respond to those Google reviews as well. Yes. Right. So I don't know if you did a response, but I know like I'm going to give an example. My my sister got this really bad review, and. I told, I told her right out of the gate, you need to respond to it really quickly with your side of the story mm -hmm. and let consumers decide what they want to do. Yeah. Don't just, don't just, uh, you know what? Consumers are going to understand that somewhere in the middle is the truth and they're, they're going to make their own minds up, right? If they already think you're a deceiving company, that person writing anything is just going to make them not want to deal with you anyways, because they already had that opinion going in. If they were kind of like, Hey, they might be a deceiving company, but the way that person answered it, I found was really professional and I'd like to deal with them just because of that. Right. And, you know, so my sister been in business for a while and she decided not to respond to this review. And now it has a one star. There's something like four likes on this one star like you can do those helpfuls or whatever yeah, yeah. and she never responded to it right and so she says you know there's people liking it there's people responding to it. like she's like ah oh, well not responding to it but she's like you know now i'm like i'm like well you know if i were you you haven't responded to any of your google reviews go and respond to all of them at once now you look like a business owner that's that's doing it yeah. but a lot of people pick and choose which ones to respond to. And I said, if you respond to all of them, people look at that as you being serious. So, you know, another thing to to, to uh, business owners is, you know, you also have to respond to it and respond to it professionally. That's, that's the other thing too. People will make their own minds up, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's terrible to get a negative review, but at the same time, yeah, if you're aligning yourself with a business, that's not going to take care of you. Right. I mean, I know for me, I try and give recommendations on someone who might be able to take a customer out and, and take, sorry, take care of a customer. And, and I do that because, well, I'm not able to take care of them and that's just what it is. So I recommend other businesses that I know specialize in that. Yeah. And occasionally I've gotten people texting me saying, you know, thanks a lot. That person took care of me and they actually didn't even charge me anything. Right. And occasionally I'll get, you know, but I, I haven't gotten anybody saying like those guys did a you know, a garbage job or anything. I haven't had anything like that, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. get all these different things, but yeah, you got to be careful with your alliances because if you're big on customer service and taking care of a client and someone else can't like, that's not good on you. It's a bad reflection on your company yeah, as well. Just because they, like they were the ones who referred the client to us, Right. Because like we don't market, we don't advertise. I don't spend any money on ads, funnels, nothing. So like the client got introduced to us from this loan officer, you know, so like the, the loan officers and the real estate agents, they're the one referring over to us. So they're saying like, Hey, here's kind of where you are at the moment. You know, we're at a pause. So we need to get you enrolled in a credit repair. And once you're good to go, we'll get you set up. So then they come over to us and everything's great. But then now the original person who sent them, so it's kind of like the role reverse, you know, the, the original person who sent them is the one who dropped the ball and admitted it, by the way. Um, yeah. You know, but now I'm the one stuck with the review and I tried talking to the client and he refuses to change it. This is, what did I say? I said, your customers are always saying something to you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is going to be like crazy, but like, you know, maybe they're saying you need to be in the loan game. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know yeah, you they want you someone who will take care of them right yeah i know that would be man that would be awesome <laughs> you say you had a, a, another question you want to ask oh yeah man like we, we always got lots of questions that's that's awesome so if there's if there is is there a book you've read that has influenced your life oh oh man um there there's a bunch so uh, the number one book that has influenced my life was the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership um, or Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Um, that has been, actually, I think I have it yeah. right here. John Maxwell. This That's... one has absolutely changed my life because um, so how I learned things, I was not a good student in school. Like I'm not very book smart. Um, I feel like this was built for me because uh, usually like you go through the chapter and every chapter there's actual, like you can fill in the words, right? Like you can fill in like the last few questions, you know? So it's like you read one or two pages and then they ask you questions about that. Then another couple pages and then questions about it. So it keeps you engaged. You want to you know, it's enough to read, to remember. And as you go through it, man, there's a lot of laws that I apply in my life today. Um, you know, and I, I absolutely love it. That was, that was the number one book that has absolutely changed my life. And then I just got to give credit to the number two, um, the atomic habits that, that number yeah. two has, has done it for me. I heard that guy's interview on Ed Milet's show it was a pretty good interview. I haven't heard it yet, but I, I can't wait to. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. No, oh, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, John Maxwell's got a lot of books I'm looking at online here. And I know as soon as I seen the name, I was like, is that the book that I like? Yeah. But no, it's it's the book I I I always praise the most is Donald O'Clifton. He's mm -hmm. the one who wrote it. So which is now yeah. Discover Your Strengths. Yep. So love that book. But yeah, I know John Maxwell's man, Oli, I think he's got like, a, it almost looks like he's got a hundred different books on like leadership and management and oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, it yeah, looks I'm like right now, um, the, the 21 laws of leadership. I don't think they're like, I don't think there's a person that couldn't get some type of value out of it, no matter what they're doing, because you don't have to be a business owner to be a leader right? You could be the leader of your household, the leader of your community. You can be an employee and still be a leader. Um, you know, you don't have to just be a business owner, but it's applicable to anybody who's just looking to just be the overall leader of their life. And um, like, one of my favorites is the law of addition, um, which is simply just talking about every time you have a conversation with somebody, you do not end it without providing some type of value. You have to add something to every single interaction that you have, you have to give somebody something. It doesn't matter, like don't look to receive, you, you have to give, add value, have them walk away with something with every single interaction, no matter who it is. And yeah, that makes sense. Thing since I've read and, you know, I, I hear it sometimes like, man, I wasn't really expecting that. Or, you know, man, that was really good information. Thank you for that. Or like, there, there's always something. So I, I like feed off of it. I just want to add value. I'm going to, I'm going to give something. I want to tell somebody something. I'm going to give them some knowledge. I'm going to give them a tip. I'm going to give them something that even if it just changes their day. Well, that's what, that's what it's all about being in the RTA syndicate is value exchange, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, a lot of people within the group understand that and, you know, you get on the call with them and you help them out. And then typically, you know, I've had other people I've helped that would give me value back in return. Right. So it's a big thing to, to focus on value exchange. That's for sure. And so it's great. That's another book, obviously focusing on that. Right. Yep. So if, if there's one thing you could change in the entire world today, what would it be and why? Mm, man, there is one thing I could change in the entire world. I would say education. So the reason that I go with education is because kind of like earlier in our conversation, we said, um, you know, people are, or businesses thrive in the financial industry, they thrive based on people not being educated. 
Hmm. And I can tell you the overall quality of people's lifestyle changes as they develop and get access to more education and then take action on it. So when I have conversations with clients or partners and I'm educating them on some way to change their spending habits or how they're using their credit, I have seen people with low credit and high credit live two completely different lifestyles. So I always say this, somebody with a 450 and a 750 score live two completely different lifestyles. They drive different cars. They live in different houses, in different areas, meaning, and the areas matter because if they have a family, their kids are going to different schools. And sometimes being at a certain high school may lose you an opportunity to go to a certain college because of where you graduated. It gives different job opportunities, different income opportunities. Like people's lives literally change based on what their scores show. But if nobody's teaching it, then the missing piece, well, there's two, but the missing piece is the education. And then it's really up to them to have that discipline or take that action or have the motivation, whatever term you want to use. But it all starts with having that education. So if I can change and improve like the poverty level, right? The struggles that people go through. One of the biggest reasons for divorce is financial stress, right? It's usually somewhere around money. So if I can improve relationships and improve how people feel about themselves and change the overall quality of their life through proper education, that's the thing that I would change. And that's actually what I'm after with, with me doing this. Like if you were to ask me in a sense, like what's the, what's the mission? Like, why are you doing this? What's the point? Um, it's that. I want to change the quality of lifestyle that people live and improve relationships. And I can't, I, I don't want to say end poverty, but I want to be a contributing factor to, you know, ending that poverty and improving people's lifestyles through their relationships and education. Yeah, that's great. I think that's it's awesome. It's a good, good goal or mission to have, right? It's great. Do you have any, final words of wisdom or anything for the, for the listeners or. Yeah. So I would say don't take advice from anybody who isn't in the position you want to be at all. And they can't just be in one aspect either. So you've heard me mention before about, um, you know, about like the weight loss thing, right? So if you have somebody that you're going to get advice from, or they're telling you how to do something, you have to analyze all aspects of their life. And that may seem unfair, but don't you want to take advice from somebody who's excellent in every one of the categories that means something to you, not just one of them? Because I think how you do one thing is how you do all things. So really audit and analyze the people that you're seeking advice from or you're receiving advice from without asking and say, okay, before I take this in and add emotion to it in my thoughts and before I think about implementing it, is this person scoring in the excellent category of everything that is important to me. And everybody has different things that's important to them, whether it's um, relationships, family, business, uh, faith, uh, whatever it is, whatever categories that you have that are most important to you, how does that person score in every one of those categories? And if they're just off the charts in all the things that are most important to you, that's who you take the advice from you know, from, from the people that score very, very high there. So if they drop the ball in any one of the categories, it's a no-go for me. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And you have to really be careful nowadays. There's a lot of people that put on this Insta famous fake yeah. image, you know, they drive around McLarens or high-end vehicles, but they don't actually own anything. Everything's leased. Right. And yeah, they pretend to be someone that they're not. And so you really have to be careful. I mean, and like we talked about earlier in the episode was, you know, there, there's a lot of people who, who uh, take advantage of you, you know, similar to being an entrepreneur, right? They mislead you. And so, you, you know, you have to be cautious and try and find out if those people genuinely are authentic. Yep. So, no, I mean, thank you for being on the episode today. I appreciate it. And uh, how does somebody get a hold of you? Yeah. So um, two ways. Actually, actually, we'll do three. So one, if you just go to Facebook, you could type in my name, Dylan Shively, you know, send me a request. Um, I'm usually maxed out. So you may have to hit the follow button. Um, and then someday I'll say something that pisses somebody off and they'll unfriend me. And then I'll go through my friends list and try to accept people. I try to do it every day. 
uh, <laughs> both ends, piss somebody off to free up some space and then I can add new friends. Um, or uh, go follow me on TikTok. So it is uh, at your credit guy. Um, you can go there. Or if you want to see more like on the business side of things and kind of learn more about what we do and who we are, uh, you just go to the company website. That'd be jameswarrengroupinc.com. Nice. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, there you go. Dylan Shively, thank you. Thanks again, man.